So, so as people walked in, there, um, I'm I'm Benjamin Mako Hill, and I'm uh, my, my my role my role today is going to be to facilitate the session, which means I'm going to try to talk as little as possible. Um, I've uh, as as way of introduction, I've been involved in two two derivatives really. I've been involved in in a, a you know a reasonably short-lived derivative called Debian Nonprofit, which put out a, a release and uh, a release and a half or so, um, and. Uh, which was a version of Debian geared for nonprofit organizations that was done within the Debian project wherever possible. Or you want to grab a chair if you want to. Well, you should. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and uh, and then I've been involved in the in the Ubuntu project, which I helped. Uh, I was one of the people who sort of was around for the beginning of that as well. Um, and I'm still involved in Ubuntu, although no longer work for Canonical. The, um, um, as you walked in, I had a, a very old list of 129 different Debian-based distributions um, as listed on DistroWatch. And I think t as of today, there's, there's closer to, two, to 200 of them. And that's not counting something that didn't exist at the time that I originally took that list, which, which, which is the derivatives of derivatives of Debian. Um, you know, uh, Ubuntu has, uh, I don't know, a dozen or, dozen or so derivative distributions and a series of other uh, Debian derivatives have derivatives as well. So, so one thing that I've thought for a long time is that Debian, to, that Debian's sort of going through this place where it's not, it's no longer, it, 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 it's still, it's pursuing the goal of being the universal operating system in a different way. Many, at some point in the near future, I don't know, I don't know if it's happened or if it will happen, I think that most Debian users will not be using Debian directly. But they'll be using Debian indirectly, and Debian exists as a very important node in an ecosystem of different distributions and drivers um, as the central node. Debian is, you know, as I said yesterday in a, in a, in a different talk, sort of the largest, perhaps the largest voluntary free software project, and, and in many senses the most expansive uh, free software project and distribution in existence. So it sort of plays this important role. Um, everyone up here represents a derivative of Debian. Um, and one thing that, I, and what I want to see come out of this, this session is, is, is a series of things. Um, I want a little bit of conversation where, where, where I sort of, where we can sort of help us, Debian, understand why there are so many derivatives. Um, and the fact that, you know, uh, as it turns out, one size does not fit all in many cases. Um, and then to sort of uh, come to terms with this in ways that can lead to sort of more uh, understanding and, and uh, uh, more productive relationships. Um, I, 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 and I want, I want us to ask ourselves what it means to be in the sort of ecosystem of distributions. And I want to put derivatives both in, in, in touch with each other um, and to sort of explain some of the common problems that we have so that Debian as an organization can uh, find ways of working with derivatives in ways that benefits Debian and that ultimately benefits uh, derivatives as well. I think, that, I think that one thing that we all have in common, the reason, you know, every derivatives that base themselves off Debian do it because Debian offers a great place of divergence and a way to do less work for the derivative and I think that done well, derivation will be something that can save everyone a lot of time, including people that, you know, use vanilla Debian. Um, so I'm also interested in sort of helping create more of an open venue where we can document these processes and put people in touch and to start thinking about what to do with tricky issues. So I've, uh, I sent out a couple calls to uh, various lists where I asked for people um, from derivatives to sort of, if you know, who were going to be here to, to state what they were interested in getting at. Um, and, and I asked a series of questions and I asked people to spend roughly about five minutes um, um, sort of quickly introducing their, their derivative. I asked people to give a brief description of their project and the nature of the relationship to Debian um, and to answer the question, why didn't you just use Debian? Uh, or in, in other words, um, in what ways if you diverge or in what ways did you need to diverge? And then maybe if, and then you know, at, at their option, a description of their greatest frustrations in working with the Debian project, um, and maybe you know, uh, uh, things that were, have been very great or useful, things you want to see more of, and maybe even a description of a, mis of a mistake made or a, or a lesson learned. Um, so uh, you know, with, that, with that introduction, I, I'd like to turn it over to each of the derivatives and to allow them to sort of uh, uh, do a quick thing. And then I want to turn it directly over to questions both from the floor and from you know, derivative to derivative uh, insofar as that's useful as well. So uh, without further ado. Uh, let's get started. Do you want to, I don't know, do you want to go first or no? Hi, yeah. Uh, my name's Luke, Luke Layton. Um, I've done 
two uh, uh, derivatives of Debian, um, which basically uh, made modifications and installed a series of defaults um, which uh, achieved specific goals. The first one was uh, Debian says, secure, easy. I'm sorry for the Americanism, uh, for those people who uh, are European. Um, uh, the purpose of that was to um, basically set up a secure, easily installable system. And um, to, to that end, it had to do security enhanced Linux, um, not the um, uh, targeted policy, but the strict policy. And it also had to run a desktop. Now, uh, that, I, I don't know if anybody's tried the security enhanced Linux, but Debian was definitely not ready for um, uh, coping with um, uh, uh, SE Linux at all um, for various reasons. And it also didn't help that I would, had just started this at the time when the freeze had taken it, it was, was in place. Um, so that was, what, three years ago? The, the Sarge uh, H, H freeze? Yeah, I think so. Um, even some of the modifications that were required were to base packages, essential packages, um, which I uh, think uh, so. Um, lib se Linux couldn't even be included. <laughs> um, I think there were some de some dependencies going on, uh, modifications required. So um, that process got in the way. Um, uh, 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 then I needed a different type of um, a K set of KDE defaults. Um, uh, I needed uh, super uh, uh, sorry, put super carambo over a, a bar, and I put on kicker menu at the top. So um, it looked very similar to GNOME um, uh, uh, with the, the kicker menu, and it was it was just basic things like the usability of the system. I actually thought about the usability. I designed an OSX bar which um, had um, hierarchical menus so that you didn't have to go, the users who did not, I mean, I, I gave the example of um, my, my uncle who's had a tendon removed from his arm, um, plus he's dyslexic and um, uh, he wears glasses. So he uses the mouse like this. Uh, there, right, okay, let's move it onto the right place. Now I need to press the button. <laughs> and puts his finger on the button and moves the mouse at the same time. Um, because he's not, because he's just not used to that level of coordination. Now if you put somebody on the K menu and they have to go click, up, sideways, up, sideways, no. So that putting a, a menu at the top where you just go click, down, was much better. Little things like that made it so much easier. But that's not even. I found this menu system, kicker menu system. I I, I put it a, a a request for packaging three years ago, and it still hasn't been put in. <laughs> it still hasn't been included after three years um, in Debian. Um, so that's a. Give you some idea of how long it takes to put, get stuff and get, get things in. Um, they just got completely missed. Now, that was even after reporting it using report bug. Um, that was the first one I did. So there was no, nothing about security enhanced Linux. I, I was just pioneering pretty much everything. So, I, and I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So the second one I did was very similar, um, which is a, an unattended install. Let me know when. Yeah. Yeah. An, unattend an unattended install system um, where everything was at down. So you get, based on the Debian install of the work that Phil Hans did, um, it pre-answered all of the questions. Right? So very di a different version of what I did before, but again, um, uh, using wget to fetch packages that didn't exist um, in, in Debian things, making modifications to config files, for example, changing FS FSCK fix equals yes, um, rather than FSCK fix equals no, which again, I've raised a bug about it, but it still hasn't been actioned and nothing's been added to the, um, uh, to the uh, Debian configuration options to make the change, which would make a simple thing, which means that when an ordinary user's computer crashes and the hard drive gets corrupted, 
they don't get presented with this thing which says press control D to continue, so they continue. <laughs> and then phone me up and complain six months later when the system doesn't work because it's totally corrupted the hard drive. Because every day they're on the switch machine on, they further corrupted the hard drive. It's little things like that. They just don't get into the, into the distributions. Okay, so I'm Jose Varela. I'm from Venezuela. I'm here representing the Venezuelan government, which has a national distribution. Um, we exist because there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding in the country about what to use and how you to use free software in the public administration. We have a legal requirement of all offices in the government to use free software. And um, sometimes when you say to people who has gone to uh, conferences in outside the country, you tell them to use Debian and they say, well, but uh, outside everybody talks about Red Hat or SUSE or any other uh, commercial distribution. And um, taking into account this, the government decided to make its own distribution, which is Debian-based. And um, until now, we have only diverged a little bit from Debian because we're using mainly preceding uh, and um, we are just modifying desktop base and we don't have uh, proper repositories. We, we haven't forked the whole package base of Debian yet, as for example Ubuntu has done. Um, so this is a very mild way of uh, introducing Debian into the government without saying that it's Debian. It's mainly because the it's not invented here uh, problem that affects a lot of uh, IT solutions in the world. Uh, we didn't just use Debian because of that, because people would say, well, it's Debian, it's just made by a bunch of hippies and everything, and um, uh, because people will reject that, uh, we are just making our own distribution. Uh, until now, we have used Debian Live for uh, our own live CDs, and uh, we are just using the Debian installer with preceding options. Uh, I have made another distribution for a company which uh, needed uh, to go further beyond uh, preceding because, for example, the PAM underscore uh, LDAP uh, packages uh, did not uh, make the possibility of preceding almost uh, every option. Uh, in general, uh, we think that we should be contributing more to Debian in the way of patches and uh, uh, modified packages and ideas. But we find, for example, the book tracking system a little bit um, tough to be used by uh, people who has no previous contributions to Debian. That's why we have like 13 or 14 uh, maintainers in our country which are trying to improve the way uh, things are happening. And we have a little project uh, to make a, a web-based uh, tool set for developers, which includes a, a building daemon, web-based, and a, a book reporter which uh, will also be web-based in a sort of launchpad thing, but not um, uh, the, exact, the exact project. And uh, a mistake we have uh, made was uh, this one of uh, just not uh, turning back our contributions to the Debian project because we think that Debian could, uh, for example, maintainers could take our change and uh, add them to the package and then we just uh, don't maintain them anymore. And um, that's a good thing. Uh, but mainly the problem was the bug tracking system and the way people should be involved in Debian in order to make a contribution. Sometimes you set something in a mailing list and you get flame or anything or you just uh, are not being taken into account. So this way uh, we're trying to make our change in a lower level and then uh, maybe Debian Venezuela or any other group of developers can uh, take that, uh, compress that, and resume that, and send to Debian in a in a good way. That's basically uh, what we have done in Venezuela, uh, and it's not a derived project. We're, we have just diverged a little bit, and we're mainly using Debian. And um, if somebody uh, wants to use Debian, it's supported by the government, so there's no problem there. All right. Hello, my name is Cesar and I'm one of the GNU Linux developers. I work for the regional government of Extremadura in Spain, and as most of you probably know, we are using a Debian-based distribution. Um, we exist because the government decided to, to use computers in the, in the schools and also in the public administration. So we decided to go free software 
because um, we think at the beginning that it would be better for us to base our distribution in a free distribution, not supported by any company of the United States or South America or South Africa. And that's the reason we chose uh, Debian to base our work. We are now using SART as a base, but we have been patch, uh, packaging some uh, kernels and also a new version of GNOME because we need to support a huge variety of hardware. And we also chose Debian because we think that it is very stable, not like other distributions. And also because, of course, it is free and free like in, as in beer. So we don't need to pay to any company to develop our software. Some of our biggest frustrations in working with Debian was the, the lack of a graphical installer. That's the reason we are still using Anaconda. This thing will be changed in the future. We are moving to the graphical installer because we think that it would be better for us to base all the distribution in a Debian, a Debian package or Debian repositories without the need of having an external installer like Anaconda. And one of the things that may be improved inside Debian to help us is sometimes that some of the packages um, have a lot of bugs that are not fixed in short time. And sometimes we have the time to send some patches to the repositories, but we are quite busy to send a lot of patches. So maybe because all the developers are quite busy and they don't have enough time to send some patches, we are sometimes um, tied to some packages with bugs and we need to fix this, those bugs and sometimes it is not easy for us because we don't know how to do that. And how could Debian change to help us? Um, we are now getting involved with the Debian Edu uh, Scholar Linux project and we are trying to push some of our packages upstream and we hope that having all our applications and packages inside the Debian repositories will be quite good for us in the future. So we will keep on working with the Debian Edu team to be able to achieve our goals. My name is uh, Peter Reinholdsen, and I am uh, one of the initiators of the uh, School Linux project, which was merged with, merged with the Debian EDU project created by uh, Raphael Hartzog uh, quite a few years ago. Um, we started because we um, wanted to uh, provide a different alternative for the pupils in the Norwegian schools than what, than what was present at the time when we started in 2001. We wanted to uh, be able to tell the pupils that it is not a criminal act to share and uh, learn how the system is working. Uh, we wanted them to uh, be able to cooperate with each other, even on the software level, without being uh, prosecuted and uh, being told to be thieves. We wanted uh, uh, the pupils to uh, be able to dig into the system and learn how it's actually constructed those curious on how the uh, computer is working should be able to find out by looking at the source, by looking at the configuration, by looking at the system. And we, don't, we didn't want them to be presented with a, what I would call an engine with a <coughs> shut, um, with a closed box around it, 
We want them to be able to uh, find out how things are working. So um, the focus for our project has always been to uh, get free software into, uh, into the schools. We are not into developing software as such. We do that as required when there is no alternative already ready for us, but uh, we are into deployment more than development. And um, we picked Debian by poor chance uh, one summer in 2001. Uh, I said that, uh, well, if we go for Debian, I can fix a CD in a month because I've heard about this Debian CD packet that was um, capable of producing installed CDs for Debian, and I had no idea what Red Hat or SUSE or whatever alternatives we had, how they made CDs. Um, nobody else was able to top that offer, so we went with Debian. Of course, we've been very happy with that choice. We have discovered more and more on how Debian allow us to uh, participate in the development and uh, uh, poke the developers to uh, move in our direction and uh, also to uh, empower the, uh, the users themselves to contact and work with Debian. We have provided a list of packages that is pre-configured and pre-installed in school Linux, but uh, the rest of the Debian archive is available for all our users and they are using some applications where we would never imagine that it was school-related at all. For example, the uh, Scribus publishing system is used quite a lot, and we hadn't actually put it on our task list before a teacher asked us, what should we do and why is not Scribus on the DVD? Well, now it is. Um, we have worked quite hard to push our changes back into Debian. When we started, it was like, I think we had like 40 special packages, backports, patched versions, modifications, and configuration packages. At the moment, with the edge-based version, we are down to, I think, eight. And hopefully, half of them will be uh, fixed in Lenny, if I'm able to convince the maintainer to get the patches we want in there. Um, not quite sure where to continue. We have been cooperating with a lot of uh, other related projects like uh, Linux in Spain and um, uh, French, um, uh, what was the name of it, Emmaus activity. The, um, we've been approached by uh, project and people that want to use uh, Linux in a school environment all over the world. Uh, for example, the Norwegian Fair project approached us and asked if we, they can use school Linux in the used computers they are shipping to Africa. Uh, so we have probably a, hundred, a few hundred schools in Africa running school Linux. Um, and the Amaus um, uh, organization in France had a similar problem. They are refurbishing used stuff like furniture, uh, clouds, and computers. And for the computers, they needed software to put on it. And they discovered School Linux, Debian EDU, and uh, found that it was really suited for their need. The focus of the um, School Linux configuration has been to provide an out-of-the-box experience for schools. It's um, basically a copy of the uh, network structure from the Norwegian uni universities in uh, Tromsø and Oslo. It's like a centralized file server, user directory, log server, system administration tools, and then uh, the desktops, the workstations connect to these and use the services. And this is working out of the box. So you have an LDAP directory with all the users and you have unified logins so all the users can log into any machine and get access to their files and, and the services on the network. Of course, this has been um, quite a challenge within Debian because uh, uh, not all Debian packages, actually very few Debian packages, are prepared for um, automatic uh, configuration at install time. And even if they are, it's normally a pain to upgrade them when uh, the configuration files are not identical to the uh, configuration file that was included in the packet when it was installed. Uh, this has improved quite a lot with um, DebConf preceding and uh, 
general awareness in the uh, Debian community that this is important, but we still meet developers within the Debian community that believes that uh, an editor is the perfect <coughs> configuration um, mon <coughs> management tool and um, upgrading is something that is only left for uh, advanced system administrators. Hmm. And upgrades is a pain because uh, normally with these problematic packages, the uh, school is left with two options. They can keep the old configuration that used to work with the old packet, or get a new configuration file that doesn't contain the configuration they need. And neither of the two options is actually useful. So um, that is still a challenge to us to, um, to find a way to handle upgrades uh, cleanly and um, autom automatically. Um, yeah, did I forget something? I think that's about it. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm Colin Watson. I work for Canonical on the Ubuntu project. Um, I guess most people probably know roughly where Ubuntu comes from, but uh, we were founded in 2004 by Mark Shuttleworth and a bunch of other uh, Debian developers who founded Canonical, uh, plus some people from various other communities like the uh, GNOME project and Arch. Uh, we're there to exist uh, to create a uh, mass market variant of Debian that's uh, released very regularly uh, on a time-based schedule uh, and that's commercially supported, um, but always with Debian as a base. Um, Mako asked uh, how, how we've d diverged or derived. Um, so I guess we've made more uh, ambitious changes than most other Debian derivatives. Uh, we've got about 2,000 modified source packages at the moment, out, and about 9,500 unmodified. Um, that has held pretty much steady over the last uh, uh, over the last couple of release cycles. So I think that's about the that's about the current figure. But uh, of course, a number of things get newly modified, and a lot of changes have been passed back over that time. It's not been entirely static. Um, the changes we make are. Some of them are bug fixes, some, some of them are different integration decisions. So uh, uh, we have our own kernel, which is quite close to stock upstream with, uh, uh, with some extra modules that we need for one reason or another. Uh, we bought into Project Utopia very heavily early on. Uh, so we bought into UDEV right at the start, uh, HAL, GNOME Volume Manager, that stack. Uh, we've got a strong interest in Python and so on. Um, of the other things we include, we've got a in fully installable live CD uh, with a graphical installer that's a rather complex front end over DI. Uh, we started out looking at uh, GTK DI and put uh, some work into that early on. Uh, at the time, that was moving quite slowly, so we ended up and wasn't quite meeting our needs. So we ended up uh, going a slightly different route. Um, we've got less upfront customization than uh, than your typical Debian install does. We focused on having much fewer questions, which I guess is a, a consequence of having a different focus. Uh, we're to start with, we were focusing quite strongly on desktop and laptop users and uh, less on complicated server installs. That may change. Uh, we've remained very current in certain selected areas, which is, an, which is another cause of divergence. So even if uh, Debian is frozen for one reason or another, uh, we still remain very current with GNOME. Uh, we keep up to date with the current upstream kernel. And, uh, uh, that's led to differences in various parts of the distribution. Uh, and we've focused on, further, on uh, allowing further derivation by removing some bits and pieces that derivatives need to deal with uh, rebranding. Some of that's gone back to Debian as well. Uh, we didn't just use Debian because we were intending to de we were intending to desync from Debian's really really schedule right from the start, and to some extent that's bound to create divergence, and we knew that. Uh, we were also making we were also taking quite some quite ambitious goals across the distribution, and uh, one of the things we wanted to 
do when setting up Ubuntu was to break the container lock on Debian packages, which uh, makes it very difficult for to perform uh, large transitions across the whole uh, across the whole package archive, uh, and that's uh, that's something that we didn't want to have to deal with as a as a as a company. Um, we also wanted to have the flexibility, the ability to make uh, various different decisions from Debian, and ideally to persuade other people that we were that the route we'd chosen was the right one. But if we couldn't, sometimes we knew that we were going to have to take a different decision for one reason or another. Um, I guess our greatest frustration is that uh, we've uh, contributed a lot of stuff, but we are perhaps inevitably held to a higher standard in some places um, than other derivatives have been. Uh, there are also some things we'd like to contribute back to uh, Debian, but uh, if you're talking about integration changes across the whole, across the whole distro, there's uh, quite a high activation energy involved in doing that. And uh, sometimes developers end up just doing it in Ubuntu and stopping there. Uh, partly because the technical authority in Debian is the entire maintainer body, so it can be quite difficult to get uh, decisions taken sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the I guess the biggest thing we'd like to see change in Debian as a result of that is uh, to have a stronger technical authority that could uh, effectively take decisions on behalf of the whole distro uh, and. Uh, we, uh, if if we were in that position, I think uh, Debian would be. That's one thing that I'm hearing from a lot of the other distributions is hard to get. Uh, it's hard to get certain kinds of changes made, and I think that would help everybody. Thank you. My name is Andreas Tillem. I started the Debian Made project in the year 2001. And um, I went a little bit a, a different way because I um, did not choose uh, to come from outside and went back, but uh, just uh, kept the power of Debian to grow inside up. It is about uh, application uh, of medical care in a wider sense. So we have uh, one part, the microbiology part. There were some applications in Debian at this time when Debian made started and now we have 10 times more, so this is quite successful, and um, microbiologists are happily using it. Uh, the other side is uh, well, the patient management part. What you expect if you go to your doctor that is running on the system of the doctor, and the problem is that uh, there is not so much upstream software to, uh, which is fit for smooth integration, and so this is uh, the hard part of the project, and it is not so uh, developed on our side and on upstream side, so we are working on it. And the, the plan is to well make um, Debian the system of choice for medical uh, stuff, and so uh, keep uh, um, make some some kickstart in the, in this field for also free software. This is more or less the sense in in this part. So um, in principle, I answered the next question: whether uh, how in how far the uh, Debian made project differs from Debian. It, it, it just d does not differ because everything is inside in Debian, because we are not uh, not we are not really strong enough to to uh, go outside. And the idea is to make some some um, separate installer later on, to, which just contains the medical stuff. But currently there is. Uh, not yet any need for an extra installer because uh, if you use plain, uh, plain Debian and, and install the meta packages, you are just ready with everything we have. So um, Debian is not split from Debian. And um, in general, um, I try to uh, get this, this um, um, custom dis Debian distributions uh, um, uh, inside the, the Debian community that it is a, quite a good idea to stay inside Debian. But um, uh, my greatest frustration is that the, the communication in between this custom Debian dis distribution is quite weak. We, we should uh, implement some common technologies and uh, I uh, will try to be a little bit to implement this uh, on a technical base and I failed uh, 
more or less uh, uh, regarding the acceptance of these tools. And I have some ideas how to make this better. And I really liked uh, uh, the part when you said uh, that Linux is cooperating with JBN Edu, so there, there is something like, uh, well, we, we share our ideas and work together and don't reinvent the wheels. And this is more or less the thing what I'm, my main focus is about in this field. Well, yes, um, um, in, in principle, this is what I wanted to say. So uh, we, we want to, to share some, some technical stuff and keep the idea alive that, that we uh, build a strong com community of custom DB distributions. Thank you. Okay, I'll try again. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kai Hendry and uh, I'm a South African who lives in London. <laughs> so um, what did I do? I founded uh, Web Converger, which is a Debian derivative, last February, though I've been doing a couple of derivatives before that in Korea, Hanux, and I've been working on an embedded distribution, which I don't think I can talk about still, but anyway. So um, the, the derivative I do is is what I like to call a web operating system. It's, it's pretty much a web kiosk, boots up, does X, and gives you Ice Weasel, which is locked down. It's all based on Edge. So it's basically Debian, but with missing a lot of stuff. So how have we derived? Yeah, one or two packages, and the, I pushed most of the stuff to the Debian Live project as much as I could. So I haven't really modified any Debian packages. There's a couple of packages of my own. That's about it. It's very, very, uh, not much. It's pretty lean and mean. So why not just use Debian? Um, well, I pretty much do just use Debian, but I'd like to have a separate repo, just in case I need to respond to some of my clients' sort of needs and wishes. And what is my greatest frustration? Um, basically not being a Debian developer. You know, I, I've been on the new uh, NMQ for about four years now. And <laughs> and I'm in damnation, as they call it. So, um, and the other frustration is that I, I really care quite deeply about the web, and I, I sometimes think that Debian developers, you know, you know, you know the general attitude to PHP and all that stuff, they don't really think of the web as seriously as I do. As for mistakes, yeah, I made a few, gosh. <laughs> um, my biggest mistake probably with my latest project is not charging my customers appropriately, because my customers are seemingly banks at the moment, and it doesn't make sense to charge them a few dollars for what I do. Because um, basically I'm just making customized CDs with home pages and things like that. So, and um, how can Debian help me? Well, Debian is really, really helping me. It'd be, it'd be nice to be a Debian developer one day, so uh, it'd be easier to push things and put in my own packages if I like, because, yeah, you can turn your Debian distribution to a web kiosk, something like that. That's it, really. Okay, so I've actually taken a bunch of notes, which we'll try to, which I, I won't go over now, because um, um, I want to uh, encourage people who have questions to come up and ask them. So, so yeah, um, um, but I'll post them on the web afterwards, and I've sort of tried to uh, synthesize a lot of the things that have been said here and sort of categorize it into different types of derivations, different reasons for derivation, sort of classifications of what that is. So, yeah, check it out after the session. So several folks mentioned things, and I think Colin articulated this perhaps the best, that there was sort of a desire for a central, authoritative, technical decision-making point in Debian. I, I'm not entirely sure what's being asked for there. Colin, maybe you could spend just a minute or two talking about that. Is this sort of this convergence of make a technical decision that in effect ends up being a change in policy which you would then like to rapidly implement across lots of packages or what's the thing that's missing that that our current structure and technical committee and so forth don't make happen for you okay uh, i'll see what i can do um so i guess if you're if you're trying to make a change that's across a uh, couple hundred packages, let's say. Um, so uh, cer certain kinds of transitions are good examples, uh, changes of defaults across a wide range of uh, packages. You can do it, it just takes a long time. Um, you can uh, file bugs against every single package affected and get and uh, 
try to get every maintainer to gradually uh, adopt your patches or not, as the case may be. Um, let's see. Uh, things like the, let me see, one recent one would be adding uh, debug packages to all Python modules. Uh, so, we, so we've got a facility centrally in, uh, in the Python build system to do that, but every Python extension has to be modified slightly to spit out the right debug package. It's a fairly trivial thing to do, um, and in some senses doesn't justify lots of energy being spent on it, but if you want to actually make it happen consistently, uh, you, uh, if without the ability to just upload everything across the distribution, you have to persuade every maintainer individually. Uh, and uh, I think we'd like there to be a way to, uh, f for people who are taking responsibility for areas of work that are orthogonal to packages, that uh, they should have the ability to do that without, uh, without necessarily assuming package maintenance of every single uh, affected package. Yeah, correct. I've run into the problem of um, changing several packages in Debian uh, quite a bit, and it is painful. For example, now I'm working on the dependency-based boot system, and that requires changes to probably like, I don't know, three, four hundred packages. Yeah, and uh, he said the same goes for Upstart. And um, to uh, talk to all those maintainers and convince them individually that this is a good thing is really a lot of work and it takes forever. A sing similar problem I've run into was to add the progress bar support to, uh, to the uh, normal Debian boot system. It requires changes to probably like less than 10 packages, but some of the maintainers are uh, actively against making it easy for progress bars. And some of them are just dragging their feet and not updating packages. This takes forever, and as long as you don't have anyone making a decision and making like, <laughs> the authority that this is going to happen. It's so, so a very thing, painful process to do. So Another the, dis thing the disconnect that I have though, Petter, is that I think that's an excellent articulation of a problem. Okay. But um, I, I still sort of haven't heard a suggestion of what you would do differently to actually make this happen faster. It sounds like Joey wants to jump up. But this is, a, this, this is something that's come up now, I think in conversations at DubCons for two, three, four, five years. So if it's one of those meta topics that we had a well, um, my, my question, I don't know if Steve Langesek is in the room to... Yeah, he's right behind you. Well, okay, Steve, what about release goals? Isn't this basically the same thing as a release goal, except it's not tied to a specific release? Um, well, not necessarily. I, as I've understood the release goal mechanism, the idea is that a team says, we want X to happen, and as, once it's accepted as a release goal, they can go make it happen, basically. Um, uh, that's probably wildly inaccurate, but... Yeah, as far as implementation of release goals, um, they're as slow or as fast as the manpower that your Debian developers have available to put into it, because if it's, a, if it's a, an agreed upon release goal that the, the release team has endorsed, we basically say, do zero day NMUs for it, and... Um, so make it happen at, at any point you want to. Yeah, so, I guess some of this has changed since I was release manager. Yeah, but, so, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Um, so, so part of what I think I'm trying to push back on a little bit is we seem to, there's several things that have sort of changed in Debian in the last few years. Sure. And, and one of the things I'd like to change is it seems we are sort of building this unconscious meme that Debian is huge and bureaucratic and hard to do things with. And I think that in any single point instance, it's easy to feel that way. And yet, when we're talking about things that are fundamentally useful, whether it's immediately specifically for the next stable release of Debian or for some larger use of Debian in the ecosystem, I would at least like to encourage us to be thinking in terms of these are things we can make happen, can get done, and should collectively have the willpower to come up with good answers for and just get on with it. So, um, you know, pardon me for pontificating for a moment, but this is one of those things that I think it's important for us to not sort of get too mired in our own self-fulfilling prophecies on. So, sure, I, I brought I brought it up not because I I brought it up not because I wanted to bitch about it, but because I'd like to see it fixed. So. Um.
if we can start seeing this improve, great. Don, and if anyone else has questions, you can just you should just feel free to step up and. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that was brought up a couple times in the roundtable was the uh, communication in two directions between the derivatives and the bug tracking system and the maintainers and the bug tracking system. And one of the things, obviously, since I happen to be uh, one of the people with the dead bugs hat on, um, one of the things that I'd like to see is better communication between derivatives who have their own bug tracking system in the BTS, um, both in terms of sending patches that are done for specific bugs, although Ubuntu is doing a relatively good job now of displaying the patches monolithically. It would be really nice to get the patches in such a way that they're sent to a specific bug when that particular bug is fixed. So the people who are making derivatives, it's easy for them to file even just wishlist bugs. Since you've obviously fixed the, um, the progress bar issue, and you did that by making patches. And so it would be nice to have a series of bugs against the patches that you, or the packages that you've patched with those patches attached. And at the end of the day, if it becomes a point that you need the TC or somebody to overwrite it, the particular maintainer, you have got all the documentation necessary to do that. Um, so those are two things I'd like to see, both better tie-in. Um, and it, of course, if anybody's using different bug tracking systems and you'd like to know, or you need the BTS to do something differently, and it'll work better for a distribution, uh, please let me know. Um, because it's something that I think all the maintainers would like to see. Um, and I know that it would make the derivatives jobs much easier because the size of your diff uh, would decrease every time a bug was merged back into Debian. Yes, uh, I'd like to clarify, clarify that uh, our project doesn't have its own bug tracking system. Uh, we're just making a front end for the Debian bug tracking system, which I think it's a good idea because uh, we can manage all the problems in uh, just one database, which is the Debian one. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, using email for communicating with the BTS is not the most user-friendly way for people who has not, not previous contribution, contributions to the, um, to the project. Um, and also, are up there. Um, one of the things that would be good is to uh, increase the usage of things and tools like Report Bug or Report Bug NG in your um, user base. Because even though they use email to communicate with the project, um, they don't appear to be email based end users. Yes. Um, also, Report Bug NG is a great um, project to base your ideas on. And also, I think that, the, for example, patches.ubuntu.com were uh, maintainers of Ubuntu, or I think it's not the maintainers, but Joseph Scott, which publishes patches there. Um, yeah, just, uh, I'm going to interrupt you again. Those are monolithic, though, which is the, but primarily monolithic. Well, I think, okay. <laughs> I think that, um, we, we cannot uh, let the derivatives to make the patches uh, because sometimes the patches are not complete or they don't know how to make patches or they don't know. For example, I have seen people who, has, who, is great, uh, who has great ideas for a package but does not have any, any idea of how to do a, a Debian package or a, even a diff file. So uh, maybe we can have a system which automatically compares the source package in uh, both Debian and derivatives and publish the differences in a web page or something. And actually, uh, the problem that Kai said about being or not being a Debian developer also uh, makes an influence because uh, when you are a Debian developer, you are expected to have, for example, some sort of communication media, which is your Debian email or an Iver Scenic, so people can get in touch with you and ask you questions. When you are a derivative, you have no communication or there's no guarantee that you can communicate with Debian anymore. Um, okay. Um, just a quick comment on the use of use of the. Uh, all right. Sorry, just a just a response to Don before we go on, if we may. Um, a few responses actually. The <laughs> firstly, the uh, while there are monolithic patches, there are also it, I don't think it's been very well advertised, but there are uh, uh, per per upload patches as well. So there's uh, deltas between. Uh, patches that are published too, and that's, that can be quite useful. Um, secondly, I think uh, while, while we do publish that, I think ultimately we'd prefer, to, we'd prefer everybody to be using distributed, distributed revision control for that, and we've put quite a lot of effort into uh, 
developing BZR, uh, uh, constructing BZR imports of upstreams and so on in order that that, can, that has some chance of eventually being a reality. Uh, there are a lot of people working on this in different directions, so we'll see how it pans out. Um, and uh, thirdly, as far as the bug tracking system goes, we did, I remember we did talk a lot early on about uh, whether we should have uh, Ubuntu bugs automatically punted into dead bugs somehow. And uh, uh, the general consensus was that we'd get shot for being evil spammers. Um, but uh, quite possibly we should be doing something better in terms of selective propagation there. Yeah, I mean, maybe if the maintainers could um, of the packages, when they see a bug that's obviously valid in both, could just duplicate it if it's not already there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I suppose a, a way to pull could be implemented. Um, I just have to talk about it with whoever wanted to do it and think it out. All right, sounds good. Uh, I think we have maybe one or two more. Yeah, and I was just going to say on the uh, derivatives using the bug system, MDebian just decided to use dev bugs as is and just see whether that, using user tags, so we just tag all our bugs in Debian um, and hope we can match them onto a Debian um, you know, uh, package, which will usually work. Uh, and that saves the whole problem of us having to have our own system and having to send them back upstream. Now, I don't know how well that'll work because that's fairly new and shiny, but I think user tags is quite flexible for that kind of thing. Um, any more questions? Time for one more. Oh, another comment. Yeah, sure. Sorry. One thing that hasn't really, uh, it's not a question of uh, coordinating between a lot of maintainers, but one thing, thing that has been worried me, worrying me as a system administrator at the University of Oslo is that the uh, Debian kernels are upgraded without changing the name of the package, so you don't really have a fallback kernel to uh, boot if the new one doesn't work for you anymore. And uh, this has been discussed last three deb confs. And I think the kernel team is really interested to have it happening, but because it requires a uh, sleeping time in the new list cube, it hasn't happened yet. I'm not sure why. And uh, it would make it a lot con more convenient to maintain a lot of machines if you always had a uh, fallback plan when the new kernel didn't work anymore? I think that's less of a problem than it might be because uh, really huge changes to the kernel tend to change the ABI anyway, so uh, that does change the package name. But yeah, it'd be nice to have something that was a bit more fine-grained in that, ideally without uh, filling up your slash boot over time as well. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and uh, I think that there's at least a couple uh, good conversations that have been started here that we can continue. So thanks. And, and, and thanks to everyone on the panel who's sat up here. So.